Hello, dear friends. Today in the Alatra TV studio, we welcome the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Greetings. Judging by numerous predictions and legends of various peoples of the world, we are living in the era of renovation of the world. There are many predictions about this. In the West, there were such prophesiers as Vanga, Nostradamus, the American Edgar Case, the Italian Ranio Nero, and many, many others. Yet, what's interesting is that even in the ancient East, they knew about the events of this time, about the advent of the era of renovation and its signs, as well as about the coming of the One who will bring the truth and justice into this world. Thus, in Asia, since ancient times, legends of the time of the Lord of Shamhala, Rigdon Japo, have been preserved. Buddhists remember the signs of the time of Maitreya over an ancient stupa, by the way it's the Alatra sign. Right. And they're waiting for the advent of Bodhisattva, Buddha of the new time of the era of Satya Yuga, Maitreya, which is translated from Sanskrit as the one who is love, the loving one. At the same time, in Hinduism, in Bhagavata Purana, it is said that when the era of Satya Yuga comes, the dynasty of the Sun God and the Moon God will be restored. Again, Alatra. Right. Muslims are waiting for Mahdi. Jews are waiting for Messiah, Christians are waiting for the Comforter, Zoroastrians are waiting for Sociant, Hindus are waiting for Kalki Avatar. However, despite different epithets, everyone is talking about one and the same time and about the same events, the events which are very important for humanity, when the destiny of humanity will be determined. Very important. Yes, of course. The events that are very important for the entire humanity, when someone will come and do everything instead of you. Right, my friends? Just look, the whole world is waiting when someone comes, rolls up his sleeves and starts working. Right? Yes, exactly. But it is interesting that information is encountered about the importance during this last period, in this era of fight between the forces of good and evil, precisely of the choice of people themselves, precisely of their active position and their active participation in that. And it is interesting that two scenarios are always described of what this future will be like. Let's say a good scenario and a bad scenario. Either there will be a golden age or, unfortunately, there will be nothing, there will be nothing and people will be destroyed. The eternal fight between Haik and Bell, right? But, for instance, regarding the Golden Age, I would really like to share the following. In the sacred books of Hinduism, it is mentioned that owing to the truth, which will be given by the future Maitreya, people will lose their doubts, and the torrents of their cravings will be cut off. Free from all misery, they will manage to cross the ocean of becoming, and as a result of Maitreya's teachings, they will lead a holy life. They will have torn the net of the passion, and theirs will be an abundance of joy and happiness, for they will lead a holy life under Maitreya's guidance. The true Dharma will open to people and enable them to create a new world, a society of love. The era of Maitreya is also called the era of the mother of the world. In Vishnu Purana, the time of the advent of Maitreya Kalki Avatar is described, when the close of the Kali age shall be nigh, a portion of that divine being who exists of his own spiritual nature in the character of Brahma shall descend upon the earth. The minds of those who live at the end of the Kali age shall be awakened and shall be as pellucid as crystal. The men who are thus changed by virtue of that peculiar time shall be as the seeds of human beings and shall give birth to a race who shall follow the law of the Krita age, the age of purity. Here I'd like to focus attention on the point that, at all times, it is exactly said that the choice of people and precisely an active position of people actually plays a decisive role. Today we are living in a special time, and all people of the world have this need in unity and this need in true friendship, because all religions proclaim one and the same truth, that God is one. All religions, let's say, call for this universal love, love for God and love for people. And any kind of delusions that one person is superior to another one or that his religion is more sacred only show and demonstrate that these people still haven't understood the very essence of their teachings. Of that teaching which they teach others. Absolutely. Because such ideas of either superiority or, on the contrary, some kind of inferiority. Right. Or elevation of oneself and belittling 
feeling of someone else. It's not the essence of the truth. Indeed, such things arise only in the hearts affected by egoism, so to say. Therefore, today, understanding the importance of unity between all of us, I would like to talk about how we can achieve this unity and how we, all people, can simply learn to respect and understand each other. Well, there are actually two ways. There are always two ways. Even for solving the task that you have just voiced, there are also two ways. One way is long and thorny. It is complex. It is, again, tied to opposition, to the system itself, to the devil himself, and to struggle with oneself. Yet, there is a very simple and nigh way. It is actually nigh for everyone. However, few people want to step on it. You know, what way is it? To stop serving Satan and to start serving God, and that's all. Indeed, to step on this way and stop listening to demons in the head. After all, every person knows what is good and what is bad. When he acts badly, he knows that he acts badly. But why does he act badly? Because of pridefulness and inner spite, meaning an emotion. And all this inner dirt doesn't come from personality. It exactly comes from consciousness, from this internal dictator, from the one who rules people's destinies, in fact. When they transfer power over themselves to him, isn't that so? Yet, why transfer power over oneself to a soulless beast that wants to eat all the time, right? Absolutely. What's the point, let's say? Why feed a bottomless pit? You'll never feed it or fill it up. That's what it is, the demon which is sitting in everyone. Stop listening to him and start serving God. Start loving each other respecting each other. Let's say, do not yield to emotions that demons send down on you. My friend, and that's it, and everything will begin to level out. Let's have a look. We've talked already many times about the creative society, that all people want it and all strive for it. Actually, all people aspire and want to live in an ideal society, this Eden, where the soul sings, where it is joyful, where everyone is united. That's what people want, and they aspire to that. Not even a creative society. I'll repeat once again, but an ideal society. It is the house we all came out of. That's how we lived for 6,000 years. Well, isn't it so? It is. While later, everything changed. And we understand that this is wrong. We understand that this is bad. Everybody understands it, but we keep doing it. Therefore, I'm telling you, there are two ways. And the second way, a long one, is to start convincing each other to fight evil, to stumble, to fall, to get up, but to continue to live again under the dictation of this demon and to cry that, I'm not strong enough, I cannot. How is this possible? It's impossible. In other words, to continue to exist in the same way as now, but at least to apply a little bit let's say, some methods of confrontation against this, then slowly, somewhere, you see, you stop yourself a little bit at some place, somewhere you do something slightly good, and something will gradually start changing. Such a long way, which we, friends, don't really have time for. No matter how you put it, but all these fortune-tellers you've mentioned, as well as all religions, again, it's all dualistic. But everyone is talking about our times, that we are all lucky. We live in this time, and the future depends on us. And it depends on each of us, whether the future will be or not, and whose side we stand on. That's what will be. That's what we will implement. Isn't that right? It is. And the problem is that people don't understand this responsibility, the responsibility that has fallen on them. Igor Mihalovich, at the end of our every video, you say the words, love each other. That's the most important point. These words inspired us to dedicate today's video to this, because we understand the importance of these words in the implementation of the tasks that all of humanity is facing now. 
Humanity is facing one task now, the easiest one, to survive. Well, we can survive again only when we begin to love each other. Everything is very simple. It's true. This was mentioned in the scriptures you've listed now. Yes. Isn't that right? Again, it all boils down to what? If we remove what is superficial, what the priests have written for their own sake, those in power distorted the truth, but the truth has remained, even in those crumbs of truth that have remained. It is said about love, isn't that so? Today, I'd like to talk about this too, because, indeed, we've collected those pieces of the Holy Scriptures of various religions, where it is said precisely about the unity and ways to overcome, let's say, disagreements between people. I'd like to begin with Islam. The point is that… Look, separation between people exists only when they live like beasts. A beast will practically never reach an agreement with a beast. The strong always dominates the weak. But the weak waits for the strong to weaken in order to suppress it. This is how we live now. Yet, people differ from beasts in that we have a soul. People differ in that we can gain life eternal. People differ from beasts in that we all have the Living Spirit, the Holy Spirit the Spirit sent by God Himself. This is what makes us different from beasts. And what is the Holy Spirit? It is God's love. It is His power. And the power of God is in love. Isn't that so? Everything is very simple. And how can we confront each other, resist, do evil, if we live in love? We cannot. In love? we will create. In love, we will respect each other, won't we? We will help each other. We will be one family. But as soon as we drive the Holy Spirit out of ourselves, a beast awakens in us, and we have what we have. But each of us longs for Him, longs for the true, longs for this love. But then, again, Demons motivate us to what? To hatred, to confrontation, to anger, even towards God and the Holy Spirit, to denial of Him, right? But why do we deny? The system is afraid, consciousness is afraid, of course. Right, because that demon is afraid of Him, and it does everything so that a person, let's say, wouldn't open the gate of his soul. Is that right? This must be understood. Well, let's listen. I would like to talk about unity and brotherhood in Islam. It is interesting that the topic of this unity in Islam is exactly one of the most important principles of Islam, and a lot is said about it both in the Holy Quran and in the Hadiths. And interestingly, the call of Muslims for unity is not some kind of recommendation or advice to a Muslim, but it's a duty of every Muslim to strive for unity among Muslims on his path. At this point, I would like to talk about why exactly Muslims, who a Muslim actually is, and why precisely such a role is assigned to unity in this religion. And what Islam is. Let's start with a simple thing. What is Islam? Love. In the right meaning, the deep one. Right. And what is love? Love is unity. It must be here, like in the spiritual world. If we live precisely by the Holy Spirit, which we accumulate in ourselves, and through which we can send our love to the spiritual world, and through which we can receive this love from the spiritual world as well, Meanwhile, is the spiritual world disunity or unity? A whole unit. It's a whole unit, yes. As it is said in all religions. The spiritual world is a whole and indivisible unit. Isn't that how it's supposed to be here among us? Here, it should be the same as there. Many in unity and unity in many. So, our entire society must live in unity as a whole unit. And Islam is the last religion. It is God's love. Naturally, every Muslim, 
Yeah. What is a Muslim? The one who believes, the one who with purity loves God in his heart. The one who loves God, the one who is loving Allah, the one who truly loves Allah is exactly a Muslim. It's not only the one who professes the Quran, Islam and the like, right? Tenants, yes. These are such tenants if we speak a simple human language, right? We have divisions into Christians, Muslims and the like. Excuse me, but did the Prophet, peace be upon him, have divisions? No. The last Prophet had an understanding and he taught all his followers that a Muslim is the one who believes in one God. And he called Christians Muslims too, didn't he? Everything is simple. Great. Igor Mikhailovich, it is interesting that the Holy Quran calls unity between Muslims a special gift that can take place with the direct participation of the Almighty. Thus, in the Quran there are the following words in Ayah 103 of Surah, the family of Imran. It is said, Hold firmly to the rope of Allah altogether and do not be divided. Remember Allah's favor upon you when you were enemies. Then He united your hearts, so you by His grace became brothers, and you were at the brink of a fiery pit, and He saved you from it. This is how Allah makes His revelation clear to you, so that you may be rightly guided. But this concerns only Muslims. In the deepest sense of the word, what a Muslim is, meaning it is for those who love God. A sincere believer. Yes, who sincerely loves God. And again, what is said here in this ayah, what you and I were just talking about, right? Right. And what is the rope of Allah? There are different versions. The point is that they even call the Quran the rope of Allah differently. There are any different versions. Yes, people interpret it from their minds. It's that very demon in them who interprets that. There is one rope that unites everyone. It is God's love, Allah's love for every Muslim. And only in such a way they can be united by one rope. They cannot be united by a book. They cannot be united by their priests' moral preaching. They cannot be united by some earthly, temporary idea. Everything will disappear, while God's love will remain. All books will disappear and priests will be forgotten. Everything will go away. Time consumes everything, but God's love remains forever. Can the rope with which He bound all those who love Him and those whom He loves be temporary? A simple question. It cannot be. But only God's love can be eternal, immutable, and never disappearing. And what is God's mercy? It is that very love. And thus we come to this understanding. But again, I'll repeat, this concerns true Muslims. That means, this message is only for those who truly and sincerely love Allah and who are united. How can there be a quarrel between them? There cannot be. And any sort of division. A single whole. How can there be division in a single whole? Of course, this is said about those people who do not serve shaitan. Right? Great. Igor Mihalovich, also Imam Ali in Najo Balaha in Kadba 192, describes the role of unity in prevention of, let's say, disagreements and religious conflicts. See how they were when their groups were united, their views were unanimous, their hearts were moderate, their hands used to help one another, their swords were intended for assisting one another, their visions were sharp and their aims were uniform. Did they not become masters of the corners of earth and rulers over the necks of all the worlds? Thereafter, also see what happened to them towards the end when division overtook them. Unity became fractured and differences arose between their words and hearts. They divided into various groups and were were scattered fighting among themselves. Then Allah took away from them the apparel of His honor and deprived them of the prosperity produced by His favors. Only their stories have remained among you for the guidance of those who may learn lessons from them. Here, I would like to discuss how to understand that Allah has deprived them of the prosperity produced by His favors. And what is Allah's favor? Again, we come to that power, to that God's love, to that which God endows a person with, meaning life. And God's love gives life eternal. So, 
When a human ceases to be faithful to God, he ceases to love God. Well, naturally, if a human stops loving God, God stops loving a human because he doesn't see him. A human exists for God only when he is living. But when he isn't living, he chooses the path of a mortal. He doesn't exist for God. So initially it was people themselves who blocked the source, right? Of course. History of humankind is simply told here in such an allegorical form, I would say. Again, if we look, there was the first half of the time when people loved one another, sort of an Eden. Later, there was a creative society. And afterwards, excuse me, there came the times when people ceased to love one another. That is, our format of this consumerist existence started to be built, in which we still exist, where man is a beast to man, merely a longing, a longing for the world, for the truth, in which people used to live in the past. Why be longing for it? Why not go ahead and do that? Well, my friends, isn't that so? Why be longing for it? If you are homesick, what should you do? A simple question. Rush there, run, take action, certainly. Of course, absolutely. And if someone destroyed it, our grandfathers and great-grandfathers and their great-grandfathers destroyed our house, then let's build a new one. Is that difficult? Indeed, there were times when there was one language and one family, I mean, after Noah's times. They say that there was precisely an ideal time and an ideal society. However, the difficulty occurred because people were like proudlings. In fact, people are not proudlings, it's all a sham. This is exactly our beastly part, which, unfortunately, broke out and became dominant in society and in everyone's mind. In fact, people are always simple. They strive for love, for life, and for joy. Nobody wants to feel bad. Everybody wants to feel good. You know, how this aspiration is interpreted by consciousness with the help of Iblis, of course, precisely in such a form where for you to feel good, you must do something bad to someone. Everyone lives that way and the like. Thus, we live under the dictation of the beast inside us. Why? Because we don't even have time to look inside ourselves and understand who we are, right? We simply don't have time and we don't want to. What for? We know everything, after all. To engage, excuse me, in self-development, spiritual development, that's ridiculous. What for? If we talk about the story, there is such one in the Bible about the Tower of Babel, about people building a tower to God in order to reach Him. But eventually… No. If we take this event, people started building this tower in order to get to Him. They were guided by their pridefulness. And according to the legend… Okay, go ahead, tell us this legend. This biblical legend is told in chapter 11 of the book of Genesis. According to this legend, after the Great Flood, humanity was represented by one people who spoke one language. They decided to build a city called Babel and a tower to heaven to make a name for themselves. The construction of the tower was interrupted by God who made people speak different languages which caused them to stop understanding each other. They couldn't continue building the city and the tower and were scattered all over the earth. Such is the story of how God divided people. I mean, it has always been somehow… It is sort of a punishment. Yes, I mean, it has always perplexed me very much inside. It's a punishment to people for their pride. It is said here to make a name for themselves, that is, to exalt their name, to build a tower to the very heaven, to get to God Himself, meaning, these people were overwhelmed with such pride that they even made such a step which made God angry. So He punished them and divided them into many. And up to this day, they search for where this Tower of Babel was, right? And they find it. They find it, confirm this historically and so on. While before that time, people lived as one family. My friends, isn't that idiotic? excuse me for such a slangy and vulgar expression, so to speak. But, in my opinion, this is utter stupidity. 
What was in this territory before that? Well, they say that Babel is exactly Mesopotamia, and precisely… Mesopotamia, right? Yeah, what was in this territory before that? So what do we come to? I guess… To Sumer, right? Right. From where it all began. Where did they rip hearts out of the alive people in order to sacrifice them to God? Where did slavery begin? Where did the first priest, first military leaders, and first kings appear? In Babylonia? Or among Sumerians? Yes, among Sumerians. So, when were the people destroyed? A simple question. When did we stop being a family? When, excuse me, did the devil win in people's minds? When did our human essence change? At that time, as it is written there, or long, long time before that. I think long ago, long before that, humans stopped being humans. Whereas here, already the dog-eat-dog -dog times are described, when they came with a sword and took what wasn't theirs. I'll put it this way, these Babylonians are themselves to blame for earning notoriety. And people still believe that this was the last, let's say, good humane relationship that got ruined and so on. Sort of, a family got separated. They deserved that. Do you know why? Because they did a really stupid thing. They conquered and imprisoned Jewish priests who were highly literate. Since they were literate, the Babylonians admitted them to their, I emphasize it, ancient libraries, and those ones engaged in census and everything else, and wrote history as well. Thus, the Jewish priest came out of there with their own teaching, which was already well-shaped and based on ancient knowledge. They formed their spiritual doctrine entirely, let's put it this way, moreover, in revenge, they wrote that before that time there had been Eden, but the Babylonians destroyed our whole world, and they are to blame for everything. That's why they deserved it. Well, yes. For having done a stupid thing, they shouldn't have imprisoned literate, smart, and cunning people. In that case, history would have been honest. You see? Yes, it turns out that the Old Testament was formed during those periods, those centuries. Yes, in that case, there would have been order and understanding in people's minds. However, they ran into those who precisely write history, not make history, but write it. After all, the future generations don't know how it was, so they read what was written for them. That's why nowadays everyone blames Babylonians for the fact that we speak different languages, right? Look how simple it is, my friends. You take paper, write what you want, and leave it for descendants. Everything is very simple, in fact. It's interesting, because indeed, the Old Testament was written in those times and formed over those centuries, precisely by priests, yes. Well, by whom else? Igor Mihalovich, there is another point that people call like-mindedness a sign of spiritual unity. And what do they say? What do they mean by that? That it means having the same thoughts, thinking of the same things, being like-minded people. So here is a question, how to reach this unanimity? How to reach unanimity in words, unanimity in thoughts, sameness of thoughts? And what kind of like-mindedness was actually meant? Excuse me, hold on. But if there is such like-mindedness, where is individuality? Are we robots? to live according to one program or what? We live according to one program now. But anyway, we somehow, everyone interprets it in their own way and performs it in a completely different way, right? In general, what does it mean to live? Thoughts are alike when people live by the same idea, but it doesn't matter whether it's a spiritual or material idea. Quite often people, especially those who have lived, for example, for 30 to 50 years together, don't even need to talk. They start speaking in unison. They understand each other without words. Why? Because the system is saving on them. The system doesn't have to program each of them separately. One program for both is good enough. Meaning, it turns out that unanimity in words and thoughts, you need to understand, let's say, under whose guidance you are united. Quite right, yes, because what does unanimity in thoughts mean? After all, we should understand, when people live, let's say, as a spiritual family, they have righteous thoughts, they are open to God, they love God, and they really live by one idea, the idea of service to God. It is clear that many people think alike, but alike in something good, Yet, what does the devil do? He copies this, distorting it. Isn't it so? It is. And we see the same thing again. A group of people who live by hatred, the same thoughts come to them. 
quite often at times, and so on. Yet they come not from the spiritual world, but from the system itself, from the one whom we call the devil. Isn't that so? It is. It is. One should differentiate between it all. Also, Igor Mikhailovich, regarding Christianity, it was also interesting. After all, the prayer of Jesus Christ at the Last Supper was about oneness. He said, May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be one in us. It is that very understanding of what both Buddha in his sermon and Jesus said that they would wish this oneness of believers, oneness in the Spirit, oneness in God. And I have a question. Why do believers not hear them? These religions have existed for thousands of years, the ones you've just mentioned. So where is our oneness? Have they succeeded? If we live in such times, And who is to blame? Is it their fault? If they laid down their lives, earthly lives, what's the difference? It is clear that they are living and nothing will happen to them. But what they went through here as human beings and the fact that they spent all this time convincing people to change, the fact that they brought the knowledge here and were conveying it to people their entire lives as long as they were present here, and they were heard and listened to. But then what? What was the choice? Separation and domination in front of one another, yes. Isn't that so? People are divided everywhere around. Hatred, envy, and a desire for dominance. Let's take a small cell, a family. Isn't it the same in society and everywhere around? For how much longer can we tolerate this? If it remains this way, further there will be nothing. We must change something. Yes, indeed, the fact of presence. You said in the beginning that all religions and prophesiers and all the rest all spoke about the same, someone will come, will do something instead of them, and so on. And again, how is it all interpreted and presented that somebody will come and do something? Well, yes, that is, consciousness thinks that the presence in the world of Maitreya or even of Jesus in their times is basically like a guarantee that everything will be fine. But in the times of Jesus… And no need to do anything, right? But in the times of Jesus, it's interesting that there is also a story in the Bible about a dispute among his disciples when they were arguing about who among them was greater. Who among them? was higher up in the hierarchy, and who was closer to Jesus. And there are very wonderful words that Jesus Himself told them. Yes, we have prepared them too. May I read them out? Since you have prepared, read them. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. This is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 25 to 27. But it is interesting that Matthew and Mark have the following last words as well. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his soul as a ransom for many. It seems to me these words are so important that… That every believer, each one who believes in God, must remember that the Lord Himself came, the Son of God, according to the Christian religion. He came to serve. But notice here, he didn't come to serve people. He came to serve the spiritual world. Did he say that he had come to serve people? But consciousness for some reason. And again, how does that very consciousness interpret it? That he came to serve people and angels serve people. They protect. And everyone serves people. And God has to, excuse me, serve people and fulfill desires like a genie. After all, this is how the demon wants to turn everything upside down in people's heads. 
while in reality he himself is as one who serves, and the greatest among you is the one who serves more. He himself came as one who serves. And here he clearly tells people, he who was closer to me, he who is higher up in the hierarchy, he who, as they say in earthly terms, has more power, he must serve as the lowest one. In other words, he should belittle himself to an ordinary person, not exult, for he is just an ordinary person, and serve whom again? The spiritual world. For the benefit of whom? Of people. Isn't it so? It is. What's the point there when Jesus said that he was as one who serves? He is the one who serves the spiritual world. I say again, in order to help people understand all the essence, all the simplicity of life, and to gain it, and to become part of the spiritual world. For the spiritual world, he is the one who serves. Isn't it so? It is. But will he serve the devil? No, of course not. And what does the devil want? Just to say that Jesus came to please people whom he rules. Such a nice situation. Yes? Well, yes, consciousness interprets these stories for its own benefit. In Islam, there is a story as well about the creation of the first human that God, that Allah, told angels to bow. But to bow to what? That is, to bow to the spirit which he, of course, let's say, had blown into the creature. But to accept as an equal. Only Iblis disagreed. And once Iblis did not agree to bow to this creature, it means that it is sort of clear that the forces of evil are those who do not bow to a human. Such conclusions come to people's consciousness. But such conclusions come that a human is superior to such an extent that he is above God, that even angels bow to him, and the whole spiritual world serves him. Only the devil such a rascal, did not want to, right? Yes. But here it is also interesting that Jesus called those who were near Him, called them precisely His friends. He said that you are no longer slaves, but that you are my friends. It was addressed to those who really follow these messages of love. Of course, of course. Did Jesus ever say that you people are God's slaves? Of course not. On the contrary, he it was the Roman Empire, after all, he was against hierarchy. Well, how? He said. Wait, did he say, fear God? He is so terrible that he will punish each of you? You wake up in the morning and be afraid and be a slave to God until evening, until you fall asleep. Remember that? Were his words like that? No. He was a messenger of love. Yet, yeah. how many times do we read about what people then wrote on his behalf? How many times do we come across the word slave and that one must fear? And how many times is it mentioned that every time Jesus said, love each other, love God, love more than yourself, then you will be with Him? Is it mentioned in the Scripture the same number of times? Or no? It was inconvenient for someone. It was inconvenient for the one who did not want to bow to a human, right? Mm -hmm. Igor Mihalovich, I would like to touch upon such an event in Christianity as Pentecost. It is probably some kind of a milestone, it is an event, because after this day, the disciples, those who were just the disciples of Jesus, became those who served and those who carried the good news. That is, this vector changes radically towards sharing the good news and towards giving. But… You know, this is a very instructive story indeed. Well, if you've prepared the material, then tell our friends a little bit about this story. This is a very instructive story, my friends. There's the essence in it. The main point, which was interesting, is surely that this feast of Pentecost is completely opposed, let's say, to the building of this Tower of Babel, when God allegedly divided people into different languages, into different dialects, and they ceased to understand each other. And exactly on Pentecost, there was an important event which changed the destiny of people, at least of the Apostles and many people to whom they preached the truth because it was the day of the descent of the Holy Spirit on the disciples of Jesus Christ. 
And on this feast, as they call it, this phenomenon was extraordinary, because from this very moment they began to preach with such inner power, with such inner… Say it, with which one? With invincibility, let's say. They had no doubts, they stopped fearing. Here, more details, please. They stopped fearing Jewish high priests, stopped fearing various kinds of oppressions, because inside of them burnt… And what did they start doing? They started to spread the good news to people. They started… What is meant by the good news which they started to spread? It is said in Christianity that they started to speak other languages. Did they just start to speak or did they speak about something? I mean… Well, while our Tatiana is searching in her gadget, my friends, now, I will tell you a story, a little bit about how it was. Based on what is said in the Holy Scripture about the story of Pentecost, we have the following situation. And let's take a reasonable look at it. There were apostles, close friends whom Jesus Christ Himself loved with all His heart and shared His bread with them, who were near Him for many years, but they were people, simple, cowardly people who doubted Jesus Christ, doubted God, who, well, some were striving more, others less, but they were partaking of this knowledge which He was giving them, and it was giving its fruit a little. They were growing a little, but they feared. They feared earthly kings, they feared Jewish high priest, they feared, excuse me, for their bodies more than for their souls. And a moment finally came, when years had passed, when Jesus Christ had been executed, when, according to the legend, He returned and they saw Him. They understood, realized, and rethought a lot of things, and the Holy Spirit came to them. According to this scripture, He returned to people many, many years after. He had left people completely after. Remember the story about the Tower of Babel, don't you? At that time, God allegedly took the Holy Spirit away from people, and people were separated, and that's it, they became beasts. And before that, there had been no one spiritualized by the Holy Spirit at all. While later, by the grace of Jesus Christ, it descended on them. And the Holy Spirit came with thunder and lightning. Everything was moving around such a… And they finally realized that it was time to stop doing nonsense. And they stopped fearing even the high priest. Can you imagine? what inspiration the Holy Spirit gave them. And they finally came out into the crowd and started talking about what Jesus Christ had been teaching them. Imagine how much time had passed, how much effort had been spent for a person to start talking. Right? Moreover, to talk in such a way that despite their, let's say, education, because many were uneducated and ordinary people, despite this lack of education, they were understood by all people, because… So wait, again, they were understood. What Paul says in Christianity is that they started speaking different languages. Different ones, yes. But if we take other authors… Luke has the same, other languages in the Acts. Yes, it is said, other languages, or it is also said, a new language. New. I mean, they started speaking a new language, one language that everyone understands. And if they didn't start speaking a new language, the one that is understandable for everyone, but started speaking just different languages, there would be no surprise. It wouldn't be written there that people were surprised. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were surprised. Do you see how Paul's words break immediately in this very story? Let's put it so, written by them. But this whole scene is completely destroyed. Why? Because it turns out that they didn't speak different languages. They spoke another language, their own language. This is the language that they had gained thanks to the descent of the Holy Spirit on them.
They spoke in such a way that people who spoke different languages understood them, and they were surprised. How come? They don't know our language. We don't know their language, but we understand what they say. Isn't it so? Yes. Or did they say, how come? There are a lot of people here who speak different languages, and they talk to each of us. They know all languages. Is it written like that? That's exactly the point, that church historians and those very apostles, Barnabas and so on, meaning they… it is not mentioned that there was some sort of mumbling in different languages. Yet, what do we see now among the followers of the Pentecostals? Excuse me, friends, by no means I judge anyone. But isn't it, pardon me, a diagnosis when people, having listened, to such precepts and teachings, in the literal sense, fall into such a religious trance that they begin to mumble gibberish. They themselves don't know what they mumble. Besides that, nobody understands them. They don't understand themselves. But this is considered to be the descent of the Holy Spirit, that they start to produce some incomprehensible mumblings in a language which doesn't exist. Why? Well, excuse me, these are already tricks of a demon, as they say in the head when he just mocks people. He mocks their faith. He manipulates them as he wants. He makes them fall into a state in which he instills in them. Well, as it is said, according to their faith, let it be done to them, right? Since they believe and want it, he gives it to them like a genie. It's not God who gives it, it's the devil who gives them this ridiculous chatter, similar to a beast roar. And they call it knowledge, a descent of the Spirit, and that. But do they understand each other when they mumble it? No, of course not. Because under one system. It's all a game of the system. What are you saying? It's just games going on, religious ecstasies and everything else. When a person, I understand if a person, again, based on what Paul said, a person not knowing languages falls into some special state which the Holy Spirit, let's say, brings over him and he begins to freely speak all languages of the world. There's no such thing. The one can speak who has learned them. Guys, this is impossible. Just because all our earthly languages in which we communicate are just the material, earthly plane, it is precisely nothing but what belongs to the material world where there is its own prince, but by no means the spiritual world. While the spiritual world unites all of us and we all speak the same language, but we don't pronounce words at that time. In this case, we don't need words. It's different. We don't need to shake the molecules of this air. We don't need electrical discharges in our heads so that we could understand each other. We understand right away. And isn't that happening right now? Of course, the fiery language, this is what fiery language is in everyone. Absolutely right. And didn't this happen? to the disciples of Jesus Christ, when they finally understood that there's God and that He should be loved, that's when it descended upon them. And then they understood that this life is momentary, while the truth is eternal. And that's when they started carrying God's Word into the world. They deprived demons of the ability to speak and forced demons to say what they wanted. They force their tongue not to keep silent, but talk about the truth. Here's exactly the victory. And it is much greater than described by people who were far from this and didn't understand this essence. Igor Mihalovich, when it is said in the Bible that Jesus Christ taught the apostles through the Holy Spirit, or gave a command to the apostles through the Holy Spirit. What kind of spiritual words are these? How is, let's say, a message for action or an instruction, a command for action conveyed through the Holy Spirit? What was meant by that? It's a need. Again, we need to understand who writes this, who interprets this, and how. It's the same as Jesus Christ, as a director calls the Holy Spirit. Well, like his deputy or engineer, and says, listen, you have a couple of plumbers there. Let them fix a crane or some socket, for instance. Go ahead, hurry. And so his deputy or engineer runs and gives an order. 
and those ones entrusted with such an order and inspired, one of them goes to fix the crane, and the other one goes to fix the socket. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's exactly how consciousness draws this. Well, if we thus remove everything yes. to the dictation of those who exactly whispered in the heads of those who wrote that, there turns out to be such a state of things. While in actual fact, when a person is endowed with the Holy Spirit, when Jesus Christ shared what He Himself has in abundance, then it arose in people as a need. When they united with this inner fire, the inner light, they understood that it is so great that it's impossible not to share it. And that's when this action awoke in them. But it was only in those who were ready not to be loved, but to love. The devil teaches people and requires from people only that they should be loved. But the devil cannot teach to love. He can teach to want, to possess, to dominate, but not to love. The devil doesn't have love. And animals don't have love. They have dependence. Well, maybe some hormonal oxytocin or something else, but it all, this is not love. This is temporary. Love cannot be temporary. Love is like life. It should always be. There is another interesting point when the Holy Spirit descended, when they were together unanimously, when they, all believers, absolutely right, were like one organism. When they were like one organism, when they were open, and when they finally understood who Jesus Christ was, when they perceived Him with their entire heart, that's when the Holy Spirit descended. Such a metamorphosis, let's say, happened in them. So the Holy Spirit comes only when you... He won't come Himself. Open up yourself first. He is always there, so to say. But is he really a thief to break into closed doors? No. He's a desired and invited guest when he is called, when he is desired. But again, note, when he is desired and called, and he is loved, and he is awaited like a beloved one, then he comes. But if he's awaited, with a list of desires, like a genie for fulfillment, well, when he... he's not a genie to satisfy people's material desires here. Or, pardon me, to pull those who live by material desires into heaven. Is the Holy Spirit really a donkey for carrying corpses? A simple question. I'm sorry for being straightforward, my friends. But this is true. This is what's in your heads. And it's in your heads because it has been put into the heads of others for centuries. And it has been put again by the demon. Also, Igor Mikhailovich, regarding other languages, that this is the fiery language and the language of feelings, first and foremost. I've recalled a situation which happened to participants of the Alatra movement, in particular to our Latin American Spanish-speaking friends, who said that their friends in Latin America, not knowing the language, feel participants of the Alatra movement. They feel what is said in the videos, and they feel this resonance. They directly feel this love and spiritual unity. This is like a present-day confirmation of the fact that the other language really unites people who understand each other while speaking different languages. When people are open and want this, it is revealed and given to them. When they are closed, they won't see this. It's like the light, like the bright sunlight. Few people know that, but even those who are blind since birth, they feel light especially those who practice and have this skill. After all, light is what we not just see, but we also feel it. While the spiritual light, well, how can you not feel it if you... Let's put it this way, there's love inside. This gives resonance. Of course, it is felt. It's exactly that other language which gives understanding, let's say, without words. And even people who don't know the language can be sitting, talking, and can understand each other until they finally realize, or someone tells them, how come you're speaking different languages and you understand each other? Until consciousness gets activated. But when they are in a spiritual resonance, they do understand each other. Words are unnecessary. 
It seems to me that it's much more important when people communicate in a common language, the language of love, the true language. How can you not see and not feel it? You can. If the devil who covers the light is in front of you, this is actually people's choice, to put the devil in front of them or to be open to God's love, to the entering of the Holy Spirit. Who urges them straight to actions, only then you become, of course, a true friend, a friend who is acting shoulder to shoulder, so to say. Yet again, he is acting not for his own benefit or for the benefit of some priest or someone else or a dictator, but exactly when people's action is aimed at serving the spiritual world and not someone's private interest or, moreover, any hatred or human stupidity. Isn't that so? As well as egoism, pridefulness, or something else. Igor Mihalovich, in Orthodoxy, there is such a saint, let's say, as Abba Dorotheus, mm -hmm. who said that in order to achieve this unity of people, the circle, Yes, I'll read it out. Let us suppose that this circle is the world and that God Himself is the center. The straight lines drawn from the circumference to the center are the lives of men. The closer they are to God, the closer they become to one another. And the closer they are to one another, the closer they become to God. Now consider in the same context the question of separation. So the closer people approach God, the closer they become to each other indeed. Well, let's say this is banal geometry, and he is absolutely right here. But do you know what the trouble is? That long before him, at least 4,000 years before he lived, he died in the 560s, didn't he? Yes. Yes. It turns out to be the 6th century in Palestine. Exactly. It turns out that more than 4,000 years before him, this was known and talked about. And we often see a circle with a dot inside. So, even in ancient times this was described. What does this mean? I will tell you to make it clear. As a matter of fact, if we approach this from the perspective of mathematics or geometry, he is absolutely right in this. While before him it was considered that there are those who are within the circle and there are those who are beyond the circle. They began to talk about this approximately in the late 5th or the early 6th millennium. Guys, I count from the time of the end of Atlantis towards our time, but not from the nativity of Christ in the opposite direction. At that time, let's say, there was already a transition from the ideal society to the creative society, which later on, almost in a thousand years, already passed into a consumerist format in the times of the activity of Sumerians. That's when this explanation appeared. Why? Because people from beyond the circle emerged. Thus, a process of vacillation slightly began, which this fading had been developing for thousands of years, until it completely came to naught. And that's when this explanation appeared. It is literally mathematical. I'm just saying, a circle, a dot inside, an approximation. Yet, if we consider this, it is also related again to the spiritual development of a person himself. When a person goes around the circle, not entering the main area, well, let's put it this way to make it clear. We live by earthly things. We walk everywhere around in our thoughts. I don't mean physical movement. We walk around and roam in all sorts of nooks of our consciousness. Everywhere. We are awaited somewhere friends meet us and somewhere foes do, who talk to us, who, pardon me, speaking modern language, troll or humiliate us or someone supports us, while someone tempts us to do bad deeds. Yet, there are also those who stop us when we want to do a wrong deed. That's what we call conscience. We are now talking about the circle of consciousness. Again, this is an ancient interpretation for you to understand. That's where there was exactly an understanding that in the middle of this circle of ours, there's a point through which we go out into eternal life. So, we should enter this circle, stop walking outside the circle and listening to bad things, but should live only within the circle where a red line is drawn of what you accept and what you don't. Your entire energy, your entire power of love should be directed to the very point 
while the point is nothing other than our soul. It is love, joy, and the like. This way our circle gradually narrowed. I mean, we ousted everything unnecessary, that which turns us into a beast, leaving within the circle those qualities and everything valuable that makes us alive, makes us a human. Well, this is one of such methods which enables one to understand how to follow the spiritual path properly. This is what concerned the lesser, but there was the greater. The concept of the greater applied to the entire humanity. There are those who are beyond the circle. There are people who are undecided or, let's say, people who consider themselves atheists or even consider themselves believers but they are far from God's love. While there are those who enter the circle of God's love, who contact it somehow, well, more or less, but they already feel there is already some response from them. They are already in a certain resonance with each other. This forms a full circle. Well, for example, our table is round and there's a red line. Beyond this red line, there live all non-believers, those who don't love God. While here, all of us enter, everyone who loves God. And we gradually approach, depending on how much we serve the spiritual world, how much we love, how big our devotion is, we are closer and closer to the center, to the spiritual world itself. Thus, the closer we are. And here, our connection is formed. After all, just imagine the distance. We are here and here, right? Right. We are far. But when we are close, look what the distance is. No matter how we take it, we are closer, we feel each other better. We become a single organism as we approach God Himself. We become His part. Well, there used to be such an interpretation as well. Yet, the whole point is exactly that the more personal effort we invest, the closer we become to God, the more we feel, and the better we feel each other. It is such a convenient mathematics, so to say, well, it has the right to exist. Entering the center, yes? Entering the center. Being completely as a unit. It is those who approach this. They already become a unit, yes. Completely. This is such a... They become a part of the spiritual world, clearly, already during lifetime. Great. It turns out that friends are actually... Friends, and here. It was considered that friends... Spiritual. Spiritual friends, real friends, are those who are within the circle, while those who are beyond the circle, well, these are just people who are undecided. Whether they will enter or not, it is their right. Again, these are just people. Well, friendship is certainly possible only when there is equality and no hierarchy of any kind. While hierarchy within the circle exactly doesn't exist, there is responsibility, but there couldn't be hierarchy in it. And again, just look, the whole world had been holding up for 5,000 years. We don't take the time of establishment. If we put it precisely, it is about four and a half thousand years, well, almost 5,000 years. It was an ideal society, Eden, where, pardon me, there was one circle. On the entire earth, there was a circle. Underground, there were those who were outside the circle. Underground, but not on earth. Hell is associated with those who are underground as well. Yes, absolutely right. And here you and I are already come across such a long, serious conversation about those who lived underground, the rest of the Atlanteans who possessed power and knowledge and were often confused with Shambhala, right? And later on, the contrary, talks began that Shambhala is underground. Well, these are people. The devil always creates trouble and shifts the blame onto somebody else. He plays mean tricks and blames someone. Such double standards which, unfortunately, often prevail in people as well. Yes, and judging by what principles people lived there, underground, discord, disunity and hierarchy, this life cannot be called heaven. Well, we actually have the same too, of course, rigid hierarchy, subordination and everything else. Did they exist? They did. But they weren't on the earth, they were underground. It is interesting that the first Christians after Christ, just like those very Sufis after Muhammad, they actually lived without this hierarchy, and there was even a time, let's say… The first Christians, of course, surely. They were exactly holding this circle. And didn't Jesus Christ talk about the circle? Great. Or didn't Buddha talk about it? They did, and certainly only after mediators emerged, there already appeared, let's say, they already stopped being focused on the center, meaning on God and each other, and already began to focus on sheikhs. You see, 
what the thing is, when the teaching was taken by people who were beyond the circle, and they took it as a tool for their own egoism, satisfaction of pridefulness and so on, it was only becoming a tool to achieve power, but when people were within the circle, they exactly used it as the knowledge which contributed to their coming into life eternal. The difference is huge in this case. Igor Mihalovich, I would like to talk about spiritual friendship. Spiritual friendship precisely consists in the point that people are within one circle, the circle of love, meaning the circle of serving God. After all, the circle is exactly the service. It's a certain group that serves and lives by this idea and this goal. It's the meaning for them. They have nothing more important than this. Yes, they already feel God's grace and are directly of course, filled with this fire, and they really desire to share this joy with other people. Of course. We have found a legend about what Buddha said. May I read it out? Well, let's listen to what Buddha said. The legend sounds as follows. Once the Venerable Ananda came to Buddha and said that, from his point of view, a half of the holy life consists in spiritual friendship. Buddha immediately corrected him, saying, Say not so, Ananda, it is the whole, not the half of the spiritual life. Why did Buddha attach such an importance to spiritual friendship? After all, many people think that, in principle, the very goal of a human is actually unification with God, salvation, and… All right, let me explain this from the perspective of the circle. The circle is life. If you enter the circle, it is your life. It's impossible to be half here and half there. You won't enter the circle. This red line separates those who strive for life and those who play at life. Those who play remain beyond the circle. They cannot have spiritual friendship. They cannot have spiritual life. They cannot have service to God. Attempts? Yes. But in fact, they cannot have this. Why? Because they haven't decided. They don't live. They don't love God. And God doesn't see them. They don't exist. That's the point. While spiritual friendship, and Buddha said that, it is exactly life. Life begins for a person when he has entered the circle of life. You see? While beyond the circle of life, there's no life, there is existence. Right. That is why I've said that in the past. This sign of life was actually depicted as a circle with a dot inside. It is life. Great. Yes. Well, without a dot and with a crescent, it's a latra. Great. Igor Mihalovich, it is interesting that Maitreya actually originates from the word Maitri which also means love, and moreover it means friend, first and foremost. And you understand that, indeed, the Easter concepts, love and friendship, cannot exist separately. Separately? Of course not. And just look, in our mundane life, friends come and go. Again, it's enough for a person to step on the spiritual path, and many friends disappear. Why? Interests are different. Well, they say, why does this happen to a person? He's a sectarian or something else. He went to a sect and became worse as a person. Yet, let us look who says that. When a person lives a mundane life, alcohol, drugs, well, not necessarily, some everyday issues, doesn't matter, just fuss, wasting time. And then a person sort of realizes that he's more than a beast, and he doesn't have only carnal desires. He has something greater. He has a chance to live. He starts searching for this life. He finds it and begins to develop it inside himself. Well, or to accumulate this love. Generally speaking, he begins to live within the circle. Then many friends remain outside the circle. Why? Because they haven't changed. And it is no longer interesting for him to be with them. He sees how they are wasting their own lives. Can he look indifferently at that? No. But they are already afraid that next to him they will become just like him. Again, 
Why are they afraid? And who is afraid in them? The demon is afraid, that he will lose his power over them as well. Therefore, he distracts them from this person. How come? It's much more cheerful to drink, hang out, and do hell knows what than to live by the spiritual, let's say. It's better, they say, to drink and have fun for a couple of years than to live eternally, right? But the point is that drinking and having fun means not to see life. It's the same as to spend it in sleep. When someone has lived instead of you for a couple of years, while you haven't seen it at all, is it actually better? It's better. Question, for whom is it better? For demons or for you, my friend? Who's living instead of you at this time? And who manipulates you? Who makes you drink, take drugs, do hell knows what, live by hatred, live by envy, hatred, envy, pridefulness? Who is it? Is this really life? Here are the answers. Yes, when people feel love, when they basically produce this love, generate it, and when they enter the circle, that's exactly when true spiritual friendship arises. Well, before, certainly… Well, naturally, of course. Well, before, it is often a play. A person remains one-on-one. -on -one. Internal demons begin to tear him apart, belittling him to the utmost, saying that life is a nightmare, that you won't succeed in anything, you are nobody and nothing, you are not worthy of this, you'll never have it, and you have nothing in the spiritual. Or on the contrary, they exalt him. Look, you're already so energy-filled. Even, pardon me, batteries can be charged from you, right? Fairy tales of one or another kind, whereas in fact the person hasn't seen life. He lives in an illusion from the demon. Well, what is life? It is exactly when the entire illusion fades, when you really gain freedom and see everything with sober eyes, just as it is. Isn't that so? It is. It is. And friendship, real spiritual friendship, is exactly when you meet the same person as you, with an open heart, with clear eyes, and without any stupid thoughts. You don't need anything from him, and he doesn't need anything from you. But you have one goal, service to the spiritual world. Again, what is the goal? To wake up the one who is sleeping. Why? Because it's more fun when there are two of us. It's better when there are three. And it's even more interesting when there are five, right? Yes. And if we are ten people, we will build the house faster, right? Yet, yeah. what if there are billions of us? Then we will build even a world here, worthy of being looked at by God Himself. Isn't that so? A simple question. And that's the point. I also wanted to share what we found in Buddhism regarding the point that friendship is not just a passive feeling, that it's an overwhelming desire of happiness and well-being towards another person, not only material, but first of all, spiritual. Again, not towards oneself, but towards another person. Who among us sincerely wishes happiness, love and well-being to another person? I mean, really wishes fervently to another person, not to oneself. Only a true friend. Isn't that so? God granted to be so. And again, it is exactly among those who are within the circle, within the circle of God's servants, so to say, within the circle of life. People are delighted to give happiness. Certainly. And why? And to multiply it in another person. And why? Because a person feels this, because he is free, and he knows that it's the most valuable and the most important. It is exactly that love and that life which a person gains through this love. And the more he shares it, the more it returns to him. Isn't that so? It is. It is that infinite which only increases when you give it. Great. By the way, Shaitan, pardon me, remakes everything in the exact opposite way. For instance, many people heard that in magic there are various rituals of such kind when you take a coin, for example, or a banknote, and you put it in your wallet, then no matter how much you take out, you have more and more in there. These are directly opposite things that demons just copy. In the material aspect, yes. So. No matter how much you spend and no matter how much you buy, notice, not give. You cannot give for free. This point is also very strict in magic. If you have acquired such a magic gift, the devil has granted it to you. You can only buy, purchase, or pay. 
for the fulfilled work, but you don't have a right to simply grant it to a beggar or to give it away, otherwise all this will disappear from you. You don't value it. You don't. I see, Igor Mikhailovich, in Christianity there is the second commandment which says, love your neighbor as yourself. My friends, whom will you actually love? Do you know who you are? And here's the very trap. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yet, what if a person doesn't really know who he is? After all, is the first question which a person should answer on the spiritual path. Who are you? And what if you don't know whom to love? Which of the masks that we wear should we love? And who am I? In fact, during the day, if a normal, reasonable person who really wants to experiment, may he be an atheist, an ardent atheist, while well, almost all our people are atheists. They just use religions as a cover, right? I mean, people on earth. Well, or they recall God when they feel bad. Or as one fellow said, even the most ardent atheist, when they rose from trenches during the battle, they stopped being atheists. Who do you think they addressed? Well, he said, certainly not some scientist, right? Definitely not Einstein. That's not the point. So, let even the most ardent atheist conduct an experiment. During the day, let them observe who a human is. Or, who I am, let's speak in the first person. This is very simple. Just observe yourselves. How many masks you change during the day? Either you are angry, or you seem to be loving, or you are a benefactor, or you are poor and miserable, ish ben sick. Sheer manipulation. So, who am I? This is the most important thing. Until we understand who we are, we will be unable to love ourselves, isn't that so? And since we are unable to love ourselves, how can we love anyone as ourselves? Taking into account what you've said, that people don't know who their true selves are, I would also like to support your words with the words by Isaac the Syrian. He who is made worthy to see himself is greater than he who is made worthy to see angels. Of course. Just tell me, what's the use in seeing an angel? A simple question. For example, a person has seen an angel. Firstly, again, this expression is quite banal. An angel doesn't have a form and cannot manifest in its essence in three-dimensionality, because that will turn out to be something sort of the other kind. Here a person can see an angel as in the flesh. For instance, if we take the religion of Christianity, even the Son of God came in the flesh and so on. When talking to Jibril, Prophet Muhammad heard and felt him, but there was no image of him. He felt that he was there. Why? Because he was the greatest among people. To such an extent that Allah Himself sent Jibril to him so that he would give him the Qur'an, the teaching, and Muhammad could perceive him. But he didn't see him with his earthly eyes, right? Let's even take, okay, whatever a person has seen an angel, what will that give him? A simple question. I will answer what it will give. First and foremost, seeing an angel, after a shock, of course, a person will start thinking, what can I ask from him? He will immediately start making a list of desires, because our consciousness doesn't distinguish whether it's an angel in front of him or it's a genie. It immediately needs to beg and ask for something. Isn't it so? It is. That's how our consciousness works. So what's the point? This is again consumerism. But when a person has seen himself, he will no longer ask anything from himself anyway. Hence what is needed. And having seen himself, he already understands the essence. Is this a greater benefit? It is. Pardon me for the joke, but there's a meaning in that. And his words are correct. What's the point if a person has seen an angel and hasn't seen himself? But when he has seen himself, he gains a chance to become alive. Great. An example. 
Abu Hamza Anas bin Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. And this is indeed a confirmation of the fact that it was in many religions. This is the truth. It was everywhere. The truth is one. Religions are many. Why are there many religions? Because there are too many people willing to exploit the truth. Isn't it so? It is. What you said certainly makes me ponder. Because in fact, if you look during the day, the majority of people, the majority of us do more evil to ourselves than anyone else does to us. Of course. That is, they wish this evil on themselves and harm themselves. But it is us who do it. Again, listening to those very demons in the head and getting tempted, we trample upon the sacred. We oppose the sacred. Whose side do we take in most cases during the day? That's what leaves us outside the circle. However, when we finally make a decision and open ourselves, let's say, for the Holy Spirit to enter, then the door to the circle opens in front of us. Great. To the circle of the alive ones. Igor Mikhailovich, regarding the words that one should love one's neighbor, because sometimes love for one's neighbor reminds of a certain indiscriminate fulfillment of all desires. What difference does it make? Look, I'll put it simply. What does love for your neighbor mean? And the closer he is to you, the greater your love should be. Isn't it so? Yes. But again, let's look at geometry. Let's look at our circle and at the dot of life. The closer we are to one another, the greater our love will be. Why? Because we become more spiritual, we become more free, we have more power of love. And naturally, since we are close to one another, we resonate at the same frequency, in the same tonality. This is what sharing of love is. Of course, this is true. Igor Mikhailovich, such a question is asked. Should I go into explanations when I see that my friend is doing wrong or is stumbling? Well, it depends, again, on when and how. If it concerns some aspects of life and he can hurt himself or someone else, then of course it's better to intervene. Why let bad things happen? But if it's his choice, for example, and he doesn't want to listen to you, then again, it's his right. A person has the right to choose whether to live or to die, right? Well, I mean, if these are spiritual aspects, how can you impose on him what he rejects? When the devil predominates in his brain, you will be talking to the devil, not a human. Is it really possible to convince him? Whom? The devil? There's no way. It's hard to awaken a person if he's already given himself up completely. Well, there can be different cases, though. We should reach out. What if this is the moment when the devil is asleep, right? And at this moment we can get through to the person. Perhaps he will recollect himself. We should try, but we cannot impose. There's such an expression, love can't be forced, right? Also, Igor Mikhailovich, there are such questions about friendship. What is the meaning of friendship for the spiritual growth of people? For there are such opinions that, why do we need friends, basically? After all, one can live without them. It's enough. Again, Tatiana, the question is a little bit, I would say, interesting. Friendship, after all, you can be friends with people who are not engaged in their own spiritual development, right? But you share some interests, I don't know, hunting, football, fishing, or something. You can be friends, and it's okay. What does your spiritual development have to do with that? If a person is unmaterialistic, he doesn't want to hear anything about the spiritual, but he's not a bad person, can there be a friendship? Yes. But it's not a spiritual friendship, it's an ordinary friendship. Again, it is based on interest. It's such a momentary interest in some kind of activity or something else, or he's a good interlocutor, or again, it's interesting with him in sports. It is simply comfort, no more than that. 
The presence of close people is not a prerequisite for salvation, is it? After all, there were hermits who not only had no friends, but also didn't meet a single living soul for years. So is friendship, let's say, does friendship have significance for a person's spiritual growth? Well, if we look at it from this perspective, I would interpret it a little bit differently. Is it easier to walk by yourself or with a group along the spiritual path? I will answer in a simpler way. Of course, it is better with a group. As for hermits, well, often those who left for deserts, left for seclusion, and so forth, well, we already spoke about this, 99.9% .9 of them were sort of with false pretense. Why? Because the trail to them never ran wild. They created such an image of themselves that they were so holy that crowds were rushing to them, day and night. Whereas, those rare individuals who really tried to go through this practice face great trouble, that it's impossible to hide from oneself, and staying one-on-one -on -one with the devil. There is even nowhere to get away. And they were exploited and often deluded. Again, a true saint should be among people and not hide somewhere from people. This is the right way. Yes. With friends, it is easier and safer on the spiritual path, and more can be done. While that one is the path of an egoist, imagine what useful things a person can do on the spiritual path for people or for the spiritual world if he is surrounded merely by squirrels and hares. Well, really, feed squirrels, paint hares, or what? Is this service to the spiritual world? As for me, I don't understand that. And friendship in the right? Others know better. Well, friendship in its right, let's say, spiritual meaning, it turns out that it is precisely the need to give, isn't it? I mean, the ability… This is service. Well, service, again, is spreading of the knowledge. It is the awakening of those who are asleep. It is the growth or the expansion of the circle. Well, since we've already touched upon the circle today, we will talk with regard to this expression. It gives more insights. That means the more people will enter into this circle, the more alive ones there will be, and the more God's love will be in this world. That's the point. Because each of us is a vessel of God's love. Let's look at this from the perspective of banks and certain funds. In this case, funds are God's love. Thus, the more there are banks and more funds are accumulated, the broader the opportunities are. I hope this is clear. Is that bad when our opportunities expand? When we can do much more? Right? So that's where it comes from, right? That the circle of God's love is the circle of power. That's precisely the circle of power, of course. Yes, it turns out that basically this is how you understand for yourself that, on the contrary, when you, for example, many people say that I don't have the ability, let's say, for friendship, but this is self-deception, isn't it? Meaning it's something that can be developed, right? No, this is not self-deception. Who says in him that he doesn't have the ability for friendship? What does the ability for friendship mean? It is, again, cheating, manipulation and the like. If we look into it, what does this person have in his head? He's afraid of people, he's unsociable, he doesn't want to be manipulated, and secretly craves to manipulate everyone. Why? Because he treats people like a dictator. Many people run away from him and so on, meaning such a life situation. Is that really a human, or are these demons? These are the masks on him. This is what was imposed on him. Well, what is spiritual friendship? It's when these masks are taken off, when you stay real, honest, and pure as a crystal. Well, as pure as a crystal, right? Right. So why be afraid? And how is that not to be friends? You are friends with yourself, aren't you? You are. So what difference does it make when it's all one? How can you not be friends with yourself? In other words, this is art which also needs to be both learned and developed. Certainly, of course. Nothing will happen without effort. Why? Because a person shouldn't just make a choice. Yes, I want to live spiritually. Then you drop on the couch and continue playing a computer game or watching a TV series, chewing snacks, and that's all. Right? And you're waiting when it will come. Well, I said I want this, that's all. No, that's not all, my friends. Roll up your sleeves and go for it, 24 hours a day. Then it will be right. Indeed, in this aspiration to be a friend, to be able to be friends from a spiritual point of view, a person's growth takes place because he overcomes his selfishness. No, the term ability to be friends is manipulation. 
While here, it means to be open, honest, and real. That's when friendship becomes honest, open, and real. You see? And not manipulative, like in the ordinary world outside the circle of life. And a person's spiritual growth takes place because he surely overcomes his selfishness and his some kind of vulnerabilities and complaints. Of course, certainly. When he clearly sees and understands what selfishness is, you see, it's like objects on the table, or like light bulbs. One went on, then another one. Well, if it went on, you turn it off, since you don't need it. Everything's very simple. Igor Mikhailovich, in Islam, it was narrated from Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, that a man was with the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, when another man passed by and he said, O Messenger of Allah, I love this man. The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said to him, Have you told him? He said, No. The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, Tell him. So he caught up with him and said, I love you for the sake of Allah. He said, May the one for whose sake you love me also love you. And also the second story, very briefly. Mm -hmm. This hadith was conveyed by Muslim. It is reported that a messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, a man set out to visit his brother from another town. So Allah sent an angel to watch over his steps. When the angel came to him, he said, Where are you going? The man said, I'm visiting a brother of mine in this town. The angel said, Do you have a favor over him to be repaid? He said, No, only that I love him for the sake of Allah Almighty. The angel said, I am a messenger from Allah to tell you that Allah loves you as you love him. And here the question is as follows, how to understand what it means, I love you for the sake of Allah? And why did the Prophet put emphasis on the fact that these feelings well, so that not just to feel, but also express and speak about one's love, to catch up with one's brother and say that he loves him for the sake of Allah. Again, a person is telling what he feels, he is telling the truth, and he is telling it openly to a person. And that person, when he sees sincerity and purity, he begins to resonate with it anyway, and he responds to him in the same way. Thus the good multiplies, love multiplies, Everything's very simple. And he tells them, I love you for the sake of Allah. In other words, I love you with God's love. I love you as my brother. Why is it important to support one's sincere feelings towards a person, even with words? Isn't it more dignified just to gain them inside? No, they mustn't be kept silent about. That's the point. The point is that these are inconvenient words, these are inconvenient actions for those demons who are in people's heads and who hold their tongues. Here the whole point is to take back the tongue of your body from the demons who control it, and to make this tongue say what you feel from the spiritual world, from your innermost, let's say, awakening, and to share this love with others, so that your tongue speaks these words of love and doesn't keep silent. The devil wants you to keep silent, and he drives everything into shadows. Yet, what hides in the shadows? Is there God's light? There isn't. In the shadows, there's darkness and rancid deeds. Isn't that so? Therefore, the point is to drag it all into the light and show it to people as it is. Great. Of course, that's the point. Do you know what else I would compare it to? We already mentioned that when a person simply bows his body while performing some prayer, this is nothing. When we bow down to the floor performing namaz or prayer, we just do physical exercise and think that we are doing something. Whereas the point, the entire essence in the truth is to make a demon in the body bow while you remain standing. But only those who have gained freedom can understand this, or at least who feel this understanding. After all, even being in Satan's slavery, people understand that they can stand even when he's breaking them down. And this freedom, the real spiritual freedom, 
When a person gains power over Satan, gains power over the body, well, again, do not confuse that the power of the body means, I want my hair to grow when I'm bald, or, pardon me, wrinkles lift up when I'm old. This isn't power over the body. Whereas power over the body means to make it bow before God while you remain standing. That's, of course, as well as to say what the devil doesn't want. Yet the devil never wants us to talk about the truth, about God's love, and about what is real. He tries to do everything to make a person feel embarrassed and reluctant, make him hide and be silent. At the same time, he makes him tell so many lies and interprets everything as he likes. You've just read two hadiths, one with the Prophet, peace be upon him, a beautiful hadith, while the other is a fairy tale for children with an angel he met. Do you see how simple this is, the truth in the fairy tale? And here, the demon will, it's clear that the person tried to explain this, he tried to illustrate it, narrate it somehow, and so on, but it's not true. Well, the first one is true, and that's the point, that's the difference. It is felt when a person is trying and when he is living. That's what makes the Prophet great, peace be upon him. Igor Mikhailovich, I also wanted to read out another hadith. Anas bin Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, said, the Messenger of Allah said, do not desert one another, do not nurse hatred towards one another, do not be jealous of one another, and become as fellow brothers and slaves of Allah. It is not lawful for a Muslim to stop talking to his brother for more than three days. In other words, not to stop communicating with him. Let no quarrels, a state of enmity and hostility continue during this term. It's interesting. Why precisely three days? Well, it's just that you once said in the videos. When to watch videos? Let's explain simply. We understand that we are mostly watched by, let's say, our friends who engage in their spiritual self-development. And they have often encountered, especially at the first glimpses of such spiritual revelations, at the first experiences of encountering the real God's love, when they get filled up with this power, when they truly hear that very inner angelic singing, when joy is overfilling them, those who have had this experience, they understand that this surge is followed by a period when during three days they are tormented by the devil in the literal sense of the word, there arise doubts, there is exhaustion, everything fails, everything is wrong. Why does this happen? Because as soon as a person has received this surge and gets this power, the devil intensifies his impact on him. However, typically, his impact lasts no longer than three days. But if a person continues to support his doubts, and internal discord, this already happens by his choice, not by the devil's impact. Because in order to lead a person astray from the path, the devil seduces him exactly for three days. And look, there are a lot of patterns that are bound to three days. Just like in such an initial spiritual experience, as well as many other things. Let's just take the most trivial things, something that will be clear to people. For example, a person craves something, it doesn't matter, be it a new phone, a bike, or some supercar, or a super yacht. A person lives by desiring it. He spends a lot of time on creating this image. How will he possess it and the like? So, there comes the time when he eventually acquires it, Day one, he is rejoicing that he has achieved his dream. Day two, he enjoys possessing it. He's proud of what he has got. On the third day, he becomes aware that it is just a thing, and disappointment comes. As a rule, it's three days. Three days are a certain cycle. 
But the point of spiritual development is precisely not to slacken even for a second in being aware that after his spiritual step, there may be an attack. A person simply strengthen his achieved positions and not step back. There is such an expression, one step forward and three steps backward. Many people often face this. I have a friend who is afraid to fly. I'll just tell you this story. He is a person with tremendous opportunities, so he got a craven for a modern superjet. And he thought, he heard a lot of talk that it was like, almost like Rolls-Royce in aviation. And when he possesses this jet, it means he would fly freely like everyone else. He wouldn't have fears and so on. Well, he had to sacrifice certain things, and he bought this jet for himself. This is what he says, literally. I will quote his words, may he forgive me. Day one, when he got this jet and entered it, he was delighted that finally he was supposedly free. On the second day, he came again. He didn't fly. He entered this plane, sat in these comfortable seats for a while, and got a feeling that he had achieved something in this life. But he also came on the third day. He decided to try to fly. The pilot came, started the engines and everything. And then the man ordered him to stop. He went out and didn't enter this plane for a year. Disappointment struck him. Why? Because on the third day, he realized that his fear of flying never went away. A year later, he sold it a third cheaper without ever taking off in it. This is a real story, an example of three days. Three days are a cycle. It's just striking how much effort the system squeezes out of people in pursuit of a goal, the joy of which lasts for three days. It creates images that we are feeding. We've already talked about this. Three days, and on the third day, everything is gone, both good and bad. There is an expression that we mourn over the dearest person for three days, and then we understand that he has passed away. According to one of the hadiths of Abu Dawood's collection, the Almighty bequeathed to believers to necessarily respond to the greetings of an offender who thus agrees to forget past misunderstandings. That's exactly the evidence that it is necessary to meet a person halfway who has a sincere intention. Even if a person offended you, but realize that he did something stupid and feel sorry for what he did, you must certainly forgive him. You cannot actually hold any grudges, no matter what they are. It's all empty. A grudge is a heavy burden that you'll have to bear if you think about it. You are wasting a lot of energy and time instead of spending it on God's love. You'll spend it on an earthly grudge. Is there a difference? To build a house or to dig your own grave? That's the point. Why would you dig your own grave? Well, a person offended you. That's his problem. He did the wrong thing. He did it. You know he's wrong. Build a house with that understanding. Let it go and forget it. Don't carry it. But if you carry it with you, you think about it. You dig your own grave at this time. You don't live. You are disappointed. You are desperate. And evil predominates in you. Can God's love come to you at this time, figuratively speaking? Or will you be in contact with the Holy Spirit at this time, so to speak? You won't. He'll be far away from you because you are busy digging your own grave. Excuse me, is the Holy Spirit a grave digger? No, of course not. He doesn't help such people. So don't carry what is hard to carry. Let it stay where you've been given it. You've been given it, but you don't take it. And then it's the problem of the one who gave it to you, not yours. Don't take what you don't need, right? Yes. You see how simple everything is. Great. After all, help really comes only to those who really aspire and want to fly up. Of course. Those are picked up. Of course. On the wings of love. You see, hatred destroys. A person is fixated on this hatred and lives by it. 
Will he benefit from it? Of course not. He doesn't live. He wastes his life on hatred, because he himself often did stupid things. Therefore, Yes, with this feeling, with what you feel, that's what you basically go over the age with. Of course. Igor Mikhailovich, in the Bible, Synodal Translation, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21-22, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And here the story of Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy is interesting. He studied Greek, he was confused by these words in the Bible, and he wanted to know how it really was. What does it mean without a cause, right? Yes, and it turns out that these words are not there, that… Absolutely right. Someone already added them. Yet a simple question. Friends, what do you think? Who added these words without a cause? And why? If you are angry with your friend without a cause… As if there is some kind of righteous anger. Right, surely. That makes an excuse for your anger, that you can be angry with a cause, right? Mm -hmm. Who could write that? The one who held the pen when he wrote it. Why? Because this is an ordinary person who is dominated by demons, who lives by their instructions, and who has anger, hatred, envy, pridefulness, and anything else. But he has to justify, right? These internal hesitations of his, his uncertainty and human meanness. Therefore, he justified that. He just wrote without a cause. So it turns out that some priest who is in service to God can be angry with a cause, right? Well, it's they who wrote that God gets angry and everything else. How can God get angry? A simple question. God and gets angry? That's ridiculous. God doesn't get angry. God forgets. A simple question, so that our friends, those who watch our videos, would understand. In one of our videos, as you remember, I asked Tatiana to recall a chamomile and imagine a ladybug on it. Do you remember that? I remember the topic. You remember the topic. How is your ladybug doing? I haven't recalled it until now. Why? After all, you did create it. That's what you actually gave life to. Your thought is material, after all. And recall the ladybug. When you imagined it, you shaped it and gave it life, and it lived. It doesn't matter that it lived in your thoughts, in the image, but it was an image. Excuse me, it really existed. And you just forgot about it and it ceased to exist, isn't it so? It is. Yes, I didn't support it with my attention. So, my friends, we must live in such a way that God wouldn't do to us what Tatiana did to her ladybug. And for Him not to do this, we must love the spiritual world and love each other. Then everything will be right, and then God will not forget us. And if the ladybug had power and loved you, could you forget it? Of course not. If it manifested this love in its every moment… Here's the answer for you. In its every day. Everything is simple, you see? And can you be angry with your ladybug? Of course not. Because for you, it's just an image. An illusion, yes. An illusion. So it is important for us not to become an illusion for God, as humanity as a whole. And this is worth thinking about. Igor Mikhailovich also, when an elder was told that one person had fallen, while the other one had done something wrong, he replied, Listen, why do you tell me about this? Tell me something good, right? Yes. You know, Quite often, in the movement, in our Alatra International Public Movement, we have many different matters, many things to do. There are people who often tell me that someone did something wrong, acted wrong, or something else. And thoughts often come to me, why are you telling me this? Simply tell me better how many good people there are in the movement and how many good things are being done. But 
I will put it this way. There are a lot of my friends who tell exactly how much good we are doing with you, my friends. And this is beautiful. While the fact that someone stumbles, people have the right to fall as well. But it's a pleasure to see them rise. That's also the point. That's why the elder was right. Exactly, yes. That's exactly the miracle when people… The miracle is exactly when people talk about the good and don't talk about the bad, like our media, the mass media. Whatever you turn on, everything is bad. Therefore, I don't turn it on. You once shared that God doesn't see all these bruises and bumps, that He sees exactly this inner inspiration of, of a person and… Of course. Yes, for Him, that's exactly what is seen from the other side. God sees our love, which, after receiving it from Him, we return to Him and don't spend it on feeding beasts. That's the point. A person multiplies it as if he mirrors it, yes. Of course. Igor Mikhailovich, I would also like to share the experience of a person who felt love for God, who felt the world of God, and who felt this love. This is the experience of Archimandrite Saproni Sakharov. In the book We Shall See Him As He Is, he writes, he surely associated love with inner fire and light. The light used at first to appear like a thin flame, healing and cleansing, consuming both within and without everything not in harmony with it but calmly, hardly making itself felt. This holy light coming in strength brings humble love, banishes all doubt and fear, obliterates every earthly consideration, the whole pyramid of secular grades and hierarchies. The repentant man becomes a nobody, as it were. He no longer stands in the way of his brother, seeks no place for himself in the world. This light is in itself life imperishable, suffused by the peace of love. It brings to our spirit knowledge of another indescribable being. Great words. And it could be said only by the one who precisely was very close to the center of this God's circle, the circle of God's love. So, my friends, let us probably end our meeting with these great words. You see how simple everything is. Let's simply love each other, be humans, and aspire to be closer to each other, closer to the center of the circle. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.